My name's Dr. Steve Austin. I'm a consultant haematologist that works primarily in hemostasis and thrombosis. And I work at two centres in South London, actually, St. George's University Hospitals Foundation Trust and also at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's Foundation Trust. You, you raise a very important question, you know, when, what, what, what effect will having a, a reversal agent have on, on clinical practice? And there is certainly a number of implications. But the first thing is, is it's important to remember that the, the direct oral anticoagulants, these new agents that we use, uh, basically have a much safer profile than uh, the previous agent, warfarin, that we were using. And that's so important to appreciate because people were reluctant to prescribe it without a reversal agent. So it raises the issue of will the presence of a reversal agent actually improve prescribing? But indeed, it probably won't be used nearly as much as people might think. So the reluctance to prescribe somewhat is influenced by anxiety over bleeding, but yet the data doesn't support that. So the first thing is it might influence people to prescribe a little bit more because they'll think there's something they can use. And certainly that's important. But actually what's really important and that will certainly have a, a big implication on clinical practice is the fact that uh, this agent can actually be used in urgent situations, whether it be in a patient with uh, uncontrolled life-threatening bleeding, which is a rare uh, problem for these patients on this drug, but it can occur, or whether it can be used to simplify and streamline management of patient who requires an urgent procedure or surgery. So you can imagine, for example, if a patient comes in and they've, they've been on dibigatran, which is the one agent we do have a reversal a strategy for, reversal agent rather for, uh, if they've been on dibigatran, uh, they can then be given the agent uh, and go off to theatre if they've, say, fractured their hip or something like that. And there's no waiting around or giving them lots of plasma products or things like that. So it will certainly uh, change that practice. It might also change the way we uh, think about uh, who uh, people who might not have put on, on, on an anticoagulant because of problems with bleeding risk. If they've got a very high has bled score, for example, or whatever tool you're using to determine bleeding risk, uh, people sometimes can be reluctant to put them on an anticoagulant. But so high risk patients, a higher risk of bleeding than the standard patient, uh, people might be more uh, happy to prescribe, uh, say, dibigatran because there is idorizumab, a reversal agent. So I think it will slowly influence uh, that. But beyond that, it will influence when these patients have procedures because if they come in and need something urgently, they don't have to wait. It will reduce bedtime you know, in terms of bed, bed stays in hospital, little, because the, the whole thing will be much less complicated. So there are big implications for practice. That's a very important question, and the first thing I'd say to you is, is that not enough. The second thing I'll say to you is that it's completely variable. It depends on what region of the UK we're talking about. If we look at the national median from last year's reports, we get about 16% of patients are on a direct oral anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention. Okay, that's versus all the rest being on warfarin. Okay, so but there's not really enough. There's still a proportion of patients who are either not treated at all uh, or are on aspirin, which I think we know very well is not an adequate treatment option uh, for stroke prevention. So basically, we need to improve that uptake still, and I hope that over the years to come, as people can get more confident in, in the use of these agents, uh, patients will be put on appropriate preventative strategies.